Good morning. Welcome to this worship service on Sunday, November 23rd. Today we are celebrating Christ the King Sunday or the Reign of Christ Sunday. It's actually the end of the liturgical year in the church. And so today, as we celebrate that, it's um, the Sunday right before Advent. So next Sunday, November 29th, can you believe it, right after Thanksgiving, will be our first Sunday of Advent. But today, the end of the liturgical calendar year for the church is where we celebrate what Christ has done for us and Christ the King. So we're going to read some passages and talk about that in a little bit. But I want to make sure, too, that you know that we always email out a link, and it's on our website, uh, the bulletin for the day. Now, I have a, a sort of a blown-up version of it, but it is front and back, and then on the inside, there's also the order of service. And I really want to make sure you also see the names for our prayer requests that are listed down here in this lower right corner as well. And then we have some other information here and there in, in the bulletin. But just want to make sure you guys had seen that and know that that's available to you in case you want to follow along. Uh, at home and everything. So as we, this will be our Thanksgiving Sunday, and there's no big Thanksgiving dinner like we normally have here that we've put on for the community. But thank you for all those who have given extra and specifically for helping those through the Canal Winchester Food Pantry and and the, uh, the donations that we're continuing to get. So if you want to be able to, to give, and I know um, I received several texts for those who want to help out other families in needs, and we can use that. Just uh, send in your donation. You can text in your donation as well to 614-877-8343. And uh, we'll use that to support other families that are in need. And so today, uh, Pastor Margo is away. But we have Bobby and Alex and Mike on drums, uh, myself, and then we have Becky on the piano. And I want to give a big thank you to our AV crew who does lots. We have... Um, how many up there? Five today that are working the cameras and the sounds and lights and everything. Thank you, everyone, for what you do for making these live stream possible, this live stream service is possible. So, my friends, our first scripture passage today is from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. And you should have that scripture on your screen at home, or definitely encourage you to get your own Bible out so you can mark it up, make notes. And so, here, Paul, in writing these this letter says that I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, that action of faith towards all the saints. And for this reason, I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. And I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the father of glory may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him. So Paul is praying that there is this understanding as we come to know God through Jesus Christ. So that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you and what are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe according to the working of his great power. God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. This is the king who reigns. It's Jesus who's far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet and has made him the head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him, who fills all in all. And so in this, in this passage, which is used on Christ the King Sunday, please understand that as we are ending this liturgical year, we are celebrating who Christ is, 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 is king, is ruler, but we do so in a way right before we anticipate the arrival of Jesus, the same person in the Christ child, this Advent. And we're gonna go through four weeks of waiting this season of preparation for the incarnation of God and Jesus Christ through us. And so as we hear of this, this letter, you know, we heard words like praying for you, that you have the spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know God, which means we are continually in an awareness and a pursuit, a spiritual discipline of understanding this love of Jesus Christ in our lives. And so that with your heart or your spirit, your understanding enlightened, you'll come to know this immeasurable greatness and power of who God is in your life. 
And so we see this, that in this letter to, to the church in Ephesus, that there's this unity of Christ. It's about reconciliation. It's about this cosmic battle between good and evil. And it's about how we live this mature Christian life in which we subject ourselves, in which we subject, in which we give of ourselves in sort of this vulnerable way for the life and love and the welfare of others and ourselves. Paul ends in chapter four in Ephesians, he says this, put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander together with all malice. Instead, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. So I want you to think about something. Where should we proclaim Christ the King? What's important to understand is that we do not associate Christ with our hierarchical worldly understanding of what a king has been or what a king does. Now, the helps gives us some image, but we have to sort of disassociate ourselves from what we often refer to as a king, which is consumer wealth, a, a culture where it's about conquest and victory and supremacy and nationalism and power and asserting over others. That's, that's not who Jesus Christ, the king is. Instead, I want you to think about the language of when we talk about Christ the King Sunday, is something that helps you focus or filter your understanding and seeing who Jesus Christ was on this earth who he was and, and what he did and, and what he taught and how he treated people. Because see, in this last passage that we deal with in chapter 25 from Matthew, we're gonna be talking about where Jesus Christ, the King, provides a judgment over all peoples on the earth. And he's gonna be looking at how did you love people? What did you do for people? So I just want us to understand that, yes, we proclaim Jesus Christ as our ruler, but we wanna do so in a way that, that welcomes and proclaims the life of who Jesus was and that transformation that we desire in our own personal lives as well. Well, we wanna sing a hymn that definitely proclaims it. So I invite our Alex and, and Bobby to come up and we're gonna sing the hymn, um, All Hail the Power of, of Jesus' Name and it's uh, number 91. and crown him Lord of all to him all majesty ascribe and crown him Lord of all Amen. Thank you. All right, everyone, let's get into our Bibles. We're gonna to turn to Matthew 25. As you know, we've been working through the Gospel of Matthew throughout the entire uh, year of 2020. And then when we get into Advent next, um, beginning next Sunday, we're gonna be dealing with some Old Testament scriptures and Isaiah and Mark. And, and then next year, we're gonna be getting into a lot of the Gospel of Mark. So we're now in Matthew 25, verses 31 through 46. And this is where Jesus... It's sort of a parable, it's sort of a story. It's dealing with um, uh, issues of judgment at, at the end of time. It's, it's apocalyptic in nature and, and the term apocalyptic means to reveal. So it is revealing something, it's not the exact description, but it is revealing something about how God through Jesus Christ, and here Jesus is, is the king of this story, um, looks at those who have been following him and doing what he has taught 
us. So let's look at chapter 25, verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. So the Son of Man is a term that Jesus has used to uh, refer to himself and sort of, uh, and, it, and it comes from Daniel, it's, a, it's, a, it's apocalyptic, end of times sort of nature. And, and really what it is saying is, it, it's allowing Jesus to identify with the humanity of all of us. So when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at the left. Now we're talking about the right hand and left hand and, and this goes back to also what James and John, the disciple, when his mother you know, asked him, can, can my son sit at your left and your right when you come into your glory? And so this is only about the left and right hand, not anything politically. And I just bring that up since we've sort of ended a, a pretty tumultuous in, uh, election season. So it's nothing to do politically. Verse 34, then the king will say to those at his right hand, come you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did it, to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Now, before we get into verse 41, please pay attention. Whenever we see in scripture something repeated, that's sort of a flag to take notice of that. What does it mean? Why is it important? So here we have where the king says something and the people echo it in their question back. And so it's important for us to see the, the what is being spelled out in there about clothing and feeding and, and providing drink and taking care of the physical needs and loving uh, people and visiting people. And then Jesus says in verse 40, and just as you did it to the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. So I want you to also underline in your Bible and take note of the term, the least of these and members of my family. We'll come back to that in just a minute. So let's go on to verse 41. Then he, the king, Jesus will say to those at his left hand, you that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me um, naked and you did not give me clothing, sick and in prison and you did not visit me. And then they will also answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry? or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or, or sick, or in prison, and, and did not take care of you. And then he will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So when we look at this, this is, there's certainly no doubt that this is about some sort of judgment, some sort of impact about the consequences of our lives. But let's look and see where we are within the Bible and what the gospel writer of Matthew is saying to us about who Jesus Christ is. And again, as we know Jesus, we know God as well. So when we talk about Matthew 25, this, this passage is calling into all of us, this ideal, this ethic, this command, this admonition, admonishment to decenter ourselves in the interest of meeting those in need with relief, relief and compassion, comfort, and dignity. So I want you to think about how and what you say and do, you know, are you the center of your life? 
Or do you seek to decenter yourself so as to center God in, in your life and to center the needs of others in your life? Now, that doesn't mean you ignore yourself. What it means is you're not just focused on all about me, 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 what's good for me at the expense of another. So you are decentering sort of your worldview, your understanding of how you treat humanity. This is what Jesus Christ has been trying to teach on the Sermon on the Mount and, and with the Beatitudes. So we are within Matthew 25. It asks us to be a, a certain way, not at the center now, interestingly, both the sheep and the goats, right, those at the right and the left, were unaware. They were not awake. They were not alert as to what was going on in their life. So, we are then encouraged to be aware, to be alert. Now, we don't want to be so decentering that we kind of get in this like, hey, look at what I'm doing. Look how good I'm being. Do you see me doing the right thing? Do you see me giving a drink to someone? That, that's not what it's all about. It's about how do we do these things instinctually, intuitively, that it becomes the fabric and part of who we are as we love others, as we are generous in our life, that without calculation, without thinking about the cost, we give. If someone needs help, we give. If someone needs a hand, we, we provide that hand. That's, that's how are we living this, this life. So I want us to think about this too. We're finishing this season of, of, of going through Matthew and we're getting ready to start Advent. So we are in this tension of waiting, this tension of the kingdom of God that's not yet fully manifest, but this kingdom of God that has come near in Jesus Christ. This Jesus Christ who represents as king the living presence of God, Emmanuel, God with us. And we're gonna talk a lot about Emmanuel as we work up to Christmas. Emmanuel, God with us. And so here is this king that is living for us. And so we're waiting, we're, we're acting in our waiting, and we're preparing. Now, we don't have time to get into it, but if you think back over the last several weeks in terms of what we've taught and what we covered, beginning in Matthew 24, verse 36, there's several par parables that talk about waiting and understanding, being alert for the, the presence of God in our life. So you had the, the parable of the faithful and unfaithful servants, you had the parable of, of the talents and uh, the bridesmaids, all of which people are waiting for the arrival of Christ, this, the second coming of Christ, of, of the kingdom of God. But to, while we're waiting, we are to be alert, we are to be prepared, we are to be ready. So, if in our spiritual readiness, we are working to be aware and be awake, in a way, we shouldn't have to ask the question, when was it? Because the people who had done well had been righteous and doing good things, they asked the same question as, as those who didn't. When was it? I guess that's maybe a goal for us, that we just live our lives so much in a Christ-like way that we're not, we're not even thinking about whether, whether Christ has seen us do this, that it's just who we are and how we live. So when was it? When was it? Now, when we go back into this, let's go back to, um, to that verse in verse 40. Just as you did it to the least of these who are members of my family. So the least of these, who are the least of these? Now, Jesus has already talked about the least of these. He's talked about it in Matthew 10, right? When he said, whoever welcomes you welcomes me and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. And whoever even gives a cup of cold water to these little ones in the name of disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. So the, the, these little ones, the least of these, can be those Christians in the early church who were being persecuted for following Jesus Christ. It can be us and others around the world who are persecuted for our faith and what we try to do. It can also be those who are marginalized, those who are oppressed, those who are disenfranchised, those who are discriminated against, and all sorts of things. So we see that there are always going to be people who are not you, who may be the other, who may be the least of these, who may be the ones who um, 
are, are those who are in need, in prison, needing clothing, needing food, needing help, needing um, medical care, needing a lot of things, see? These are the least of these. Now, he's already taught this, so it's not, it's not unfamiliar to us. Now, there's a promise in here, and there's, and there's a, a command. So let's go to verse 34, because I want you to see there. It, it, we can sort of skip over it by accident, because in verse 34, the king will say to those at his right hand, come, you that are blessed. So this, this command to come, this command to follow, this command to... Um, Come, all of you who are believers of Jesus Christ, who, ha, who are understanding of, of what God is doing in this world, come and receive. See, you see the word there? It's inherit the kingdom that has been prepared for you. So all that Jesus Christ is about, and Matthew talks a lot about that, right? The kingdom of God that's in conflict with the kingdom of the world. There's this promise that for us, Everything that has been talked about within the Bible, how Jesus lived his life, is there for us. Come and inherit it. Receive this. And so that is, is comforting. Now let's go back to this question. When was it? When was it? So both had missed it. They weren't paying attention. And we know, as followers of Jesus Christ, that we are to be aware, to be awake, to be alert, to, to notice what is going on around us. We decenter ourselves so that we can center on what God is asking us to do in, 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 this, in our lives. Because in doing that, we receive the fullness of the kingdom of God as we seek to follow God. Now, this life of discipleship, it's important to note because it, I, I don't wanna just stand here and have you think that just because you follow God, just because you believe in Jesus Christ, that your life is gonna be perfect, that everything is going to go well for you. This life of discipleship ultimately leads to the cross. And what do we mean by that? It ultimately leads to the cross. Jesus Christ went to the cross, the humbleness, the death, the crucifixion, to the cross, we go to the cross to humble ourselves before what Jesus is asking us to do. And so there are going to be times where what you do as a follower of Jesus Christ isn't gonna be winning you any popularity contests, but it's about living a life in joyful obedience, about learning more in depth what it means to be merciful to others, to extend grace to others, to extend compassion to others, even when that is not being readily dumped in your lap? Do you have this ability to share that, to do that, to live that with others? So when we talk about this joyful and obedient living, it's going to take us to places of the cross. It's going to take us to the cross in the life of our family, in our, in our community, in our society. But it also takes us to the same place where, where Jesus suffered for us. And as Jesus suffered, as we suffer, we see what it is like to live in a way, it, it, is, it is revealing to yourself because it, it matches you in with this. Because when Paul said, I want the heart, your eyes of your heart enlightened, you can talk about it, you can read about it, you can hear me talk about it to you, you can even listen to me tell you a story about it. But until you live it, until you do it, until you experience it and are aware of what God is doing in you as you do this, as you're near your cross, you'll just never fully understand it. And so that's a, that's, a, that's a goal, it's a challenge, it's part of how and why we live our life. And so we have to pay attention. And so we have to be aware of these, you know, when was it, when was it? Because I don't wanna go through my life and, and say, well, when was it, God, that, that, that I missed you? We want to be alert, to be aware of what is happening. Now, when we talk about this, um, I, I kind of skipped over to the second part of verse 40 because Jesus says, these are members of my family. When you do it to the least of these, these are members of my family. So the people that we might be excluding in our life or that we think maybe aren't good enough or whatever, these are the ones who Jesus Christ are saying, these are part of my family. 
Now that should strike a, uh, something in your heart, in your mind, in your spirit that should make us all a little uncomfortable because I think we all have people that we discriminate against, that we think are lesser than, for whatever reasons. And so when we're tweaked in our heart and in our thinking and in our spirit, we see that Jesus is saying, these are part of my family, the least of these. And so that should challenge us to check how we think and how we act. So remember, when Jesus taught the Sermon on the Mount, when he was ending those Beatitudes, he said, you are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. That means that we go out and do these things so that when at the end of the time comes, when Jesus says to us, you gave me food when I was hungry and you gave me something to drink when I was thirsty, you showed me hospitality, you welcomed me when I was a stranger. When I needed clothing, you provided it. When I was sick, you took care of me. The salt of the earth, the light of the world, we as the followers of Jesus Christ, that is what we are to do and find a way to do that. Now that's gonna mean something different for every single one of us. So look at your own inner circle. Look at your own inner circle. That means those who you go to school with, your friends with, your immediate family. What are you doing with them to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world? What are you doing in this time of waiting and preparation to to be aware of what's going on inside of you? Because it's interesting, right? When the when the when the goats, as it were, those on the, the left, they when they asked those questions, it was almost like they were blaming Jesus, the Son of Man. Well, you didn't reveal yourself to us. How are we to know it was you? As if we'd have known it was Jesus, would we have done something different? Would we have treated them different if we known that we were being watched? I mean, the Bible teaches, Jesus talks about how all deeds done in the dark will eventually come into the light. You may be able to hide something, but eventually it will come out. God sees, God knows, God loves, God's trying to lead us in this life and extending grace and mercy and forgiveness to us. Remember the parable of the rich young ruler? He said, well, you know, Jesus, I follow all the rules and laws. What, what else am I supposed to do? And Jesus said that one thing that was really the hang up for him. He couldn't get rid of all that he owned. He knew that was separating from him. It was almost like an excuse, this, this way to rationalize why we don't wanna do things. You know, Pastor Margo talked last week about this aspect of laziness that all of us have in our lives, this way we rationalize and make excuses for why we don't have to do things or why we can be indifferent or why we can, be, we can ignore Now, let me also point out that we can't handle every single problem out there in the world. We're not built that way. We're not designed that way. And I was talking with folks earlier in the week, think about what your body does, right? So I can choose to talk, not talk. I can choose to move my hands. But what I don't think about is how I breathe or when I breathe. I don't have to tell my heart to beat. It just does things. Because if we had to remember, hey, talk, move your hands, chew gum, breathe, let your heart beat, we wouldn't be able to keep up. So we're not designed to hang on to all the grief and, and junk that is, that is happening out there in the world and to us and solve everything. Jesus is saying, those who you come into contact with, those who you welcome, those that's in your group, in your family, whatever it may be, how are you being in a way that lives the Beatitudes, that lives the Sermon on the Mount, that lives the way that Jesus lived and talked. So we have these these questions. And again, I think this story, one of the reasons I like it too, is that it's a reminder that God is there amongst those whom we don't think God might be amongst. And that's important. It's important for two, two, two main reasons. One, 
you might be that person who feels left out, alone, no resources, forgotten about, always struggling. You are part of God's family. That should give you hope. That should give you comfort. And for those who may feel like, well, I got it all together, so it should be pretty easy for God to love me. And why would God love those people over there that just keep making all kinds of bad decisions time after time again? It's a wake-up call for us to say, yes, God is with them. They're part of God's family. So as a Christian, we need this in a time when we are getting ready to celebrate the arrival, the inbreaking of God into the cosmos, into our life, to change the trajectory of what we do as a world, as a culture, as a society. We need that wake-up call before we ask, well, and before we blame others, well, how come you didn't reveal yourself to me that we look internally? Yeah, when was it? Is my heart right? Is my thoughts right? Is what I'm trying to pursue in the right way? And then we have to ask the question, who, who might I be leaving out of the reign of God? Who might I be leaving out of the kingdom of God? Because God certainly hasn't left them out. But maybe I have. So, it's a challenge for us. I love this parable. I love the questions because it, it, a lot of times people will say, What's my purpose? What's God calling me to do? There must be something. Well, everything's right there in the Bible. God wants you today to be who you've been called to be, which means you are a family member of Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters, all of us linked. And so are you giving? Are you providing food? Are you providing drink? Today, you're not, you're not asked to go out and solve world hunger, to solve cancer, all these other things. But be that presence, the living presence of God in someone's life. One moment at a time, one small act at a time. The Reverend William Barclay talks about that. Just be today who God asked you to be. Don't try worrying about trying to be somebody years down the road. Everything that the Bible shows, there's, there's a process by which things move and grow and develop. The giant oak tree is in an acorn one day and two days later, 60 feet tall, right? And in the same way, when the, when the Israelites were wandering out in the wilderness, the manna that God provided was enough for that day. If they tried to store it, hoard it, keep it, it rotted. When we say in the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread. So in this day, we are to just be who we've called us to be. If God laid out for you your whole life plan, because I think about it, if God would have told me it, when I was 15 or 18, this is, this is what's gonna happen to you. This is gonna be the tragedies in your life. This is what you're gonna do. This is what you're not gonna do. This is the accidents you're gonna be in. This is the, the, the loss that you're gonna experience. It would have been overwhelming. We wouldn't be able to handle it. But instead, God says, I'm enough for you right here today. God is enough for us. So this parable is a great reminder that one, as we've accepted Jesus Christ, as we, as we live into this life, we will be recognized as the family member of, of Christ. Come and inherit everything that has been prepared for you since the foundation of the world. Because you've been living in doing what I've asked you to do. And so my friends, may that be for you the same, amen.